Now we come to a watershed in the prehistory of humankind. We begin our extensive exploration of the world's first civilizations, the pre-industrial civilizations. Part four of this course surveys the very first civilizations of all, which appeared in southwestern Asia about 5,000 years ago. But before we get into specifics of Sumerian and Egyptian and other civilizations, we must look at some of the background, because the rise of civilization has been one of the great academic discussion grounds of the last century. How do we define civilization? This lecture begins by looking at that and some of the common characteristics of what archaeologists call states or pre-industrial civilizations. A pre-industrial civilization is one that does not depend on fossil fuels but depends on human hands for labor or sometimes just simply civilizations. And then next we'll analyze the major early theories surrounding the origins of states just like we did with agriculture. The theories which invoked single, often very simple, causes for the appearance of states. And then finally, we'll spend time surveying current thinking, which assumes that many factors were involved in the creation of pre-industrial societies. Some of them ecological, and then of course other social, the all-important roles played by individuals and groups. I'll argue that a unique period of social inequality and cultural change in the eastern Mediterranean region about 5,000 years ago allowed ability, individuals of exceptional ability to forge the first civilization out of much smaller chiefdoms. A complex process and still little understood. The point is that we really can't look at the early states without looking at some of their commonalities. What were they? What are the salient features about them? What made them different from earlier, more egalitarian societies? And the way we look at this is through archaeological theory. So today we're going to explore some of those theories. 5,000 years ago, the world's first literate civilizations appeared in southwestern Asia, in Mesopotamia, and along the Nile River. Their appearance was a major turning point in the human past. Part four of the prehistory of humankind describes the earliest civilizations in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Eastern Mediterranean. We span a period from the fourth millennium BC to about 1200 BC. Compared with the earlier parts of this course, our chronology is beginning to shrink. We're beginning to think in centuries rather than tens of thousands of years. But first, what do we mean by civilization? If you go to Webster's or you go to the ultimate arbiter, to me an Englishman of the English language, the Oxford Dictionary, you will find a definition of civilization that implies civility, a measure of decency in individual behavior. Such definitions reflect value judgments or what is called ethnocentrism, looking at things from our own cultural values. Because what may be civilized in one civilization may be antisocial or baffling in another. For example, the accumulation of great wealth by individuals is common in our society but baffling in many others and so on and so forth. Today archaeologists, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time defining civilization in this course, tend to use the term as a shorthand. Civilization means urbanized state-level societies. In contrast Earlier and other societies without cities and other features we'll look at in a moment were pre-state societies. Very simple definition, really a rag bag into which we put all measure of different pre-industrial civilizations. The civilizations described in this course I refer to and already have referred to as pre-industrial civilizations. Why? 
because they relied on manual labor rather than fossil fuels such as coal to power the civilization as it were. This means that one of the critical elements of a pre-industrial civilization was that somewhere, somehow, somebody had to be able to command the unquestioning loyalty of hundreds if not thousands of people for public works, to man their armies, for agriculture, for irrigation systems. And that was the big feature of these civilizations, the ability to control labor. Now, there are many different variations between individual pre-industrial civilizations. For example, the Inca civilization of the Andes is quite different in many of its institutions from that of the ancient Egyptians. But these two and all the others share a number of common features. And what we must do now is have a quick look at these because they're very, very central to the notion of a state, to what I talk about when I talk about a civilization. The first feature is that all these societies, whether Egyptian, Sumerian from Mesopotamia, or Mayan from Central America, all of them were based on large cities. What is a city? For the purposes of this course, it's a community with more than 5,000 people. Teeny by our standards, but by the standards of the ancient world, large. A complex settlement with very large, complex social organization behind it. Why? Because cities require complex infrastructures. And society as a whole had a very large, complex social organization, which has been likened, as we will say many times, to a social pyramid. A few people at the top, a lot of people below. Another feature of states. They control much larger territories than societies did in earlier times or ones that did not form part of civilizations. How did they do this? By trade, by force, by political fiat, by tribute, and taxation. Because all the pre-industrial states share a type of economy which was based on the centralized accumulation, and I stress the word centralized, accumulation of capital and social status through tribute and taxation. In other words, a few people monopolized trade and exchange they monopolized redistribution of food supplies, and so on. Everything flowed to the center. This type of economy allowed the support of hundreds, often thousands, of non-food producers, artisans, bureaucrats, priests, the notion being that here, for the first time, you have a large number of people who didn't cultivate the soil. You've moved beyond the notion of a household which supported itself. People now bought their food in markets, were paid wages in rations, as was the case in Egypt, and substantial segments of society never went into the fields at all. Concomitant with this, the centralization, was another major change. An advance in all these societies towards some form of record keeping, science and mathematics, and most important of all, some form of written script, or a close alternative, like for example the famous kipu, the Inca knotted string, which was a form of code which expert scribes, and I think you can call them that, kept inventories of what was in each district of the Inca civilization simply by knots on strings. We talk about writing. We talk about literate civilization. What does this mean? It's very different from today. We live in a society which is universally literate or close to it, where we say, oh, literate civilization, everyone could write. But in pre-industrial civilizations, 
information was power. To be able to write and to read meant that you controlled information. And in the very early civilizations, most written records are little more than scribes, inventories, inventories of transactions. Indeed, the first writing may have developed out of such transactions. It's only later that you find poetry, schoolboy texts, political documents, and so on. A very different type of literacy from that in modern society and one that was tightly controlled. To be a scribe, say, in ancient Egyptian civilization was a very, very prestigious position to hold. The ancient Maya lords, when they conquered a subject city, would mutilate the fingers of the scribes from the conquered city because they had access to information. So writing was very important. So was the validation of authority. And this was achieved in a number of ways. By impressive public buildings, common to all societies, Maya pyramids and temples, Mycenaean palaces, the great temples of Luxor and Karnak in Egypt, monumental architecture, palaces, temples, and other prestigious buildings. But almost invariably, these had a deep symbolic meaning. Because the other common feature of the early civilizations, which is so important, is some way of assuring conformity, of ensuring that the authority of the government, the ruler, was validated. There was nothing that the early civilizations, the leaders of them, didn't know about spectacle. Almost invariably, the public appearances of the ruler, who was considered very often to be a living god, were carefully rationed, and when they occurred, involved spectacle, magnificent spectacle, chants, dancing, speeches, sometimes human sacrifice, where the multitude dressed in their best clothes, would witness a public ceremony which validated the ruler as a god, or as a representative as a god, or as an intermediary to the divine ancestors. That's why the pyramids in Egypt are so large. They were validation of the relationship between the pharaoh and the sun god in the heavens. That's why the great city of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztecs, was laid out as a symbolic model of the Aztec cosmos. That's why inscriptions on temples were so important, why hieroglyphic signs, why statuary was so important, because this, like a medieval cathedral, validated the order of the cosmos and the authority of the king. Pre-industrial civilizations were social pyramids run for the benefit of the few and ruled with firmness, conformity, and sometimes harshness. They were a civilizations based on very, very powerful ideological messages which set the order of the cosmos and validated the order of life. So you must always think of them as closely related to the cosmos. There's still this sort of flow between the secular living and the spiritual, just as we had with Cro-Magnon rock paintings or with mother goddesses and so on. You have a continuity. All these societies were surrounded by a concept of the cosmos. Archaeologically, research into the early civilizations focuses in particular to the origin and the development of both state-organized societies, or civilizations, if you prefer to call them that, and the city. The city assumed many forms, from the compact, walled, mud-brick settlements of early Mesopotamia, to the elaborate Maya ceremonial centers of Mesoamerica, with their core populations densely in the precincts at the center of the city and a scattered rural population in much smaller settlements in the surrounding hinterland. 
Definitions of what is a city abound. But the most common arbitrary one, as I already mentioned, defines their lower limit of population at about 5,000 people. But a density of population much higher than that in small settlements. A defining characteristic. In fact, many of the early Mesopotamian settlements, uh, cities, were simply agglomerations of individual villages which found it better and more economic to live closer together. And I wager that the quarters of these different cities in fact comprised close kin, people who used to live in a village, and so on. Cities have another characteristic too. They are marked by specialization and interdependence between the city and its rural hinterland. The city was a central place in the region, providing services for smaller settlements around it. Most early cities had major marketplaces, like the great marketplace of Aztec Tenochtitlan, where agricultural produce was sold and exchanged as well as all sorts of other goods. Cities had a level of complexity and organization far greater than that in a village or town. They were centralized institutions, almost invariably with major public buildings and ceremonial structures around a central precinct. Their institutions preserved law and order, regulated trade, maintained security, often behind imposing city walls. They were, like states, strongly centralized institutions. One can liken them to a pyramid with a teeny elite and a solitary ruler at the pinnacle with a huge mass of commoners at the base. Again, the notion of a pyramid. The city lies at the very core of the state. But how did these states originate? A huge theoretical literature mushrooms every year which goes on and on, writing basically about the same things. All we can do here is navigate rapidly through some of the major ideas. Writing about early civilization began with the writings of Vere Gordon Child of agricultural revolution fame, who wrote about not an agricultural revolution, which we described in Lecture 15, but about an urban, urban revolution. Now the Victorians, 75 years earlier, had followed the Greeks and Romans in believing that Egypt was the cradle of a human civilization. But the discovery of Sumerian Mesopotamian civilization in the late 19th century showed that civilization's origins were much more complex. In the 1920s, the University of Chicago Egyptologist James Breasted coined an enduring phrase the Fertile Crescent, a curve of territory which encompassed the Nile and Jordan valleys, the highlands of Iran, and lowland Mesopotamia. He described this Fertile Crescent as the cradle of civilization. Gordon Child in the 1930s went further. He wrote of this urban revolution I just mentioned, in which metallurgy, the formation of cities, and more intensive agriculture, including irrigation, as well as specialized artisans, played leading roles. Ultimately, he argued, a class-based society came into being, based not on the traditional ties of kin, but on economic classes, on skills, on being a soldier or a priest. Writing, more effective long-distance transportation, such as sailing ships, and then eventually wheeled vehicles, and a state religion, were all essential ingredients of a pre-industrial civilization. The notion of an urban revolution was popular for many years, but is now seen to be so simplistic, for many of its features, which Child identified, were in fact characteristic of earlier civilizations as societies as well. But all scholars now agree that three elements of the urban revolution hypothesis were of great importance. Large food surpluses, diversified farming economies, and agriculture, irrigation agriculture. The next generation of theories resolved around simple ecological explanations. 
Some of these theories focused on the ecological potential of river floodplains, fertile enough to produce huge food surpluses to feed growing populations. Another body of theories pointed to the ecological diversity of local environments in areas like the Nile Valley and Mesopotamia, which allowed the earliest civilizations not to rely just on one food source, but on foods from closely different neighboring ecological zones. For instance, under this argument, the highland Andean states of South America relied heavily on their lowland neighbors for fish meal, cotton, seaweed, and other resources. In turn, the coast um, received potatoes and other crops from the highlands. Such diversity provided protection against crop failure and famine. A very pervasive group of theories discussed irrigation agriculture. Such agriculture has the potential to support much denser populations. Population, uh, scholars of the 1920s to 1950s argued that some early civilizations, like those of Egypt and Mesopotamia, were hydraulic societies controlled by massive bureaucracies who controlled the canals, the building of reservoirs and dikes and so on. In fact, more recent research has shown that large-scale irrigation works were in fact the product of later stages of these civilizations. For example, the Egyptian pharaohs didn't really get into irrigation seriously until about the Middle Kingdom, that is after 1500 BC. In recent years, some other theories have come forward. Massive expansion of trade, massive engagement in warfare have been involved in theories that say that these were the primary causes of state formation. In fact, much more detailed research in areas like coastal Peru and the Near East has shown that the intensification of both trade and war was a consequence of, rather than a cause, of statehood. What then do we know about the rise of early civilizations? This is all getting rather confusing. We can say a number of things. Firstly, the world's original civilizations came into being during periods of major social and economic change. This means, and we will survey these developments later in the course, means that simple one-cause explanations of civilization, like warfare, irrigation, or trade, are inadequate. As a result, recent theories of the origins of state involve multiple and often intricate causes. We can divide these theories really into two broad categories. Many experts see the early civilizations as very complicated living systems with many interacting components or subsystems which contributed to cultural change so that an emerging more complex cultural system in an early civilization developed by interacting with the very much more complex ecological system of which it was part. So you had an ecologically based theory. And they argue these theories for a multi-causal explanation in which many factors, among them climatic and environmental change, played major roles. You cannot blame people for having these theories. For example, the rising waters of the Persian Gulf after the Ice Age may have created favorable environments in Lower Mesopotamia for much larger settlements and more intensive agriculture. Something we will look at in Lecture 20, a transformation of the low-lying delta of southern Mesopotamia, which happened so fast that the landscape literally would have changed within the compass of a single generation. 
There's a problem with ecological theories, though. They tend to be rather impersonal. They deal with general processes of cultural and social change. They talk about feedback. They talk about population growth. They talk about intensification of agriculture or whatever. They tend not to be about people. And the second major contemporary group of theories surrounds people. You call them, I suppose, as a general, you could call them social theories. In recent years, scholars have played a great deal more attention to the complex dealings of individuals and groups negotiating with each other, arguing, reaching agreement, falling in love, hating, fighting each other, whatever you like, the whole spectrum of human behavior, because they argue that decisions made in good faith in the short and long term by individuals and groups really shape civilization, shape social change. The combination of economic control over the sources and distribution of food and wealth, the development and maintenance of a stratified system with all its ideology, and the ability to maintain control by force were all vital factors in early states, as we shall see. But these things wouldn't work without people doing the decision making. And the interplay between these three sources of power led to the development of new society-wide institutions like supreme rulers, bureaucracies, and new concepts of what human society should be like. So people are all important. The problem is that human behavior is often intangible, and this is the great challenge. There was none, no, no one moment when civilization came into being, for society continued to evolve after they appeared. Pre-industrial civilizations functioned in a milieu of constant change and frequent dispute. That's why some collapsed and others survived for centuries and millennia. The world's first civilizations developed in distinctive political environments, in dynamic crucibles of competing chiefdoms, where eventually one chiefdom achieved dominance over the others, which became the provinces of a larger political unit. This can be clearly seen in the long processes of unifying ancient Egypt into a single kingdom, which we'll talk about in Lecture 21. There's one lesson to learn. But in the final analysis, it is people and groups who are responsible for political and cultural and social change. Such seminal individuals, like the first Egyptian pharaoh, Horus Aha, were the agents that brought civilization into being. But unfortunately, we know the names of very few of these people. Aggressive individual uh, individuals of great ambition and ability have always existed in human societies. However, the widespread conditions of social inequality and chiefly competition, which developed in some parts of the Eastern Mediterranean world about 5,000 years ago, proved to be a unique catalyst for such men and women to churn from being powerful tribal chiefs into authoritarian divine kings. They supported new ideologies which developed from earlier and much less complex worldviews. In other words, suddenly the world got infinitely more complicated, infinitely more socially and politically sophisticated and demanding for those who ruled, and ideology was the key to their success. This lecture began by defining what archaeologists mean by a civilization and a state, and we defined pre-industrial civilization and then summarized some of the common features of these early pre-industrial civilizations. And then we've discussed the early theories which accounted for the appearance of civilization, all of them with a single overriding cause. We concluded they were too simplistic, and then examined the recent multi theories which combine environmental actors with a strong emphasis on groups and individuals. For there is a strong social dimension to the origin of states. And in the next lecture, we'll see how these theories apply 
in Mesopotamia.